Good morning, everybody, and especially our primary audience, who is the China University of Technology. And welcome to our talk today, which forms part of the delving into the world of invasive plants, biodiversity assessment, and range land management series. Um, so today we're going to do something a bit different. It's not Monday, it's Tuesday today. So before we go ahead, I'm going to play a short game with you. In front of you, there is an image of a plant. And I want to know if anybody is able to tell us which species of plant that is. You have 10 seconds, go. Okay, another answer is, um, I do not know either. <laughs> What I wanted you to get from this image is that if you focus on the white part, you see a tree. But if you focus on the black parts, you'll actually be able to see that there are two faces on the side. So I hope everyone is able to see that. Okay, now that we all warmed up, you have 10 seconds again. I want you to count how many times the letter F appears in the sentence. Again, 10 seconds, go. We're looking for the letter F. Okay, so that's that. The majority of people will count three, but the correct answer is six. And the psychology, and this is published psychology, is that as humans, we often overlook the word of, O-F. In fact, it's easy to overlook many things, especially things that we are unaware of. And one of these things is called Forbes. But what are Forbes? That is what our speaker today is going to tell us. Dr. Yalga van Kolle, is currently a DSI NRF Professional Development Program postdoctoral fellow at the South African Environmental Observation Networks in Gluvo Mode, Node, or Scion. She splits her time between the Lowfeld and Northwest University at the Portschiffstrom campus, where she is integrated into the Forb Ecology Research Group. Her research interest has been to explore the community ecology of herbaceous communities in nutrient hotspots of semi-arid African savannas. And her research aims to contribute to a better understanding of the ecosystem services and function that forbs provide, as well as the ecology, since this component of herbaceous layers is poorly represented in savanna research worldwide. Yalga is a post, Yalga's postdoctoral research aims to aid in understanding the effects of mega carcasses on plant productivity and forage quality through surveying, analyzing, and comparing vegetation dynamics across mega carcass sites of different ages. With that, I hand over to you, Dr. Yalga. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Aisha, for the warm welcome and the introduction and also for the opportunity to share with you some of the knowledge that I have gained in my postgraduate um, studies, but more importantly, my love and appreciation for a less studied, um, but, but ecologically important plant life form. And so like Aisha said this morning, I will be telling you guys a, a little bit more about Forbes. So before we get into the thick of it, um, I would just like to refresh your memory on some definitions. Um, so biomes are defined based on dominant forms of plants and animals and the prevailing um, climatic factors. And they have characteristic plants and animals um, living together and to some degree of permanence. Um, and they broadly correspond with climatic regions as moisture and temperature strongly influence plant establishment and survival. 
So the general plant characteristics give a distinctive appearance to biomes and a visual signature that we can use to recognize a biome. For example, grasslands have mostly grasses and forests have mostly trees with plants, some plants growing beneath the canopy. So as you all know, South Africa has nine biomes, as you can see on the map over here. Um, and although all of these biomes have forbs in the vegetation layer, um, most of my experience and knowledge lies within the savanna biome, which stretches across various of the country's provinces, particularly Limpopo and Hukumalanga, where most of my field surveys, as well as fellow students' field surveys and projects um, take place. So savannas cover 20% um, of the global land surface and 40% um, of the land surface of the African continent. It's the largest biome um, in Southern Africa and it covers approximately one third or 53% of the land surface of South Africa. And as you might have noticed in my title, I refer to semi-arid savannas. Now these savannas, are characterized by an annual rainfall of below 650 millimeters. They are considered water limited um, systems of which the primary productivity strongly interacts with rainfall. And therefore rainfall is considered one of the major drivers of vegetation dynamics and especially um, herbaceous layer dynamics. Um, and just to remind you, primary productivity refers to the total amount of organic material produced by plants. So um, a semi-arid savanna can therefore be defined as um, a, a strong, oh, sorry, <laughs> a strongly seasonal and water-limited plant community with a relatively continuous herbaceous layer consisting of forbs and grasses and a discontinuous woody component. And that's what I wanted to illustrate or tried to illustrate in my, in my picture over here, where you can see the continuous herbaceous layer consisting of the various grass species and the forb species, which are represented by these flowering plants. And then the discontinuous woody component, which um, consists of um, trees and shrubs. Now, identifying the mechanisms that allow trees and grasses to coexist in savannas without the one life form outcompeting the other is one of the most widely discussed topics in savanna ecology. And although we know a lot about this, um, this topic and a lot of research has been done about it, one of my um, main focus areas of my research is to disentangle the dynamic coexistence between forbs and grasses in, in savanna ecosystems. And yeah, so the forbs and then the grasses and how they coexist. Because we know that forbs and grasses um, co-dominate um, in the system, <clears throat> sorry, and often this dominance switches um, in response to environmental changes. So I've been talking a lot about forbs and grasses, and I know that you all know what a grass is, but what exactly is a forb? And I think the general term that most of you might have come across or heard before is a wildflower. Um, but for a more sciencey definition, um, forbs constitute a plant life form that can include any non gaminoid vascular plant with mostly herbaceous above ground plant parts and limited woody tissues. Um, so that's quite a mouthful. So let me break it down a little bit more. So non-graminoid refers to herbaceous flowering plants that are not graminoid. And graminoid refers to grasses and sedges, which are two other types of herbaceous life forms. And then a herbaceous plant is any vascular plant um, that does not have true woody tissues or have limited woody tissues. Um, so yeah, I wanted to show you some different types of forbs and some of my favorite types of forbs, just to let you know um, that they are morphologically very different. We get fat forbs or succulent forbs, thin forbs, um, upright or erect growing forbs, forbs growing close to the ground, 
some are hairy, some are not, and some might even have spines. So the first example that I included here is called Barleria elegans, and you can see the very elegant white flower and the spiny bract over here, um, which serves as protection. Then we've got Pomelina africana with its lovely um, yellow flowers, and you can see that the leaves of Pomelina africana um, are quite hairy. And then we've got a fat one, Portulaca carnosina, which is a succulent forb species. Um, Ruilia cordata, you can see uh, it, it grows erect or upright with a lovely purple flower. Um, Blepharis integrifolia, um, usually while in flowering time, they've got lovely small little purple flowers, but if you can focus your attention, you can see they also have spiny bracts um, on the plant as well. And then we've got Tribulus terrestris, lovely yellow flowers, and as you can see, they grow in a prostrate manner, so they grow um, flat flat on the, on the soil surface. And then lastly, just this here flava, and here you can see a lovely butterfly pollinating the flowers, the yellow flowers. And this is also an example of an erect or an up, um, upright growing fork. Um, some examples of grasses, the dominant grass species in this photograph is Gerobilus nitens. And over here, we've got a lot of Panica maximum. And I included the example of Cyperus rupestris, which is an example of a sedge. And we can see that a sedge is a grass-like plant. So they look kind of like a grass with inconspicuous flowers. We typically find them um, in wet soil and they mostly belong to the Cyperaceae um, plant family. Um, so in this slide, I would like to highlight um, some of the challenges when it comes to forbs. And I think a lot of these reasons is why you guys maybe not know of forbs or maybe have seen them before, but are not aware of their functional importance in, in ecosystems. So forbs are poorly represented in definitions of savannas and in ecology in general. The ecological investigations into the role of forbs in savannas and also other systems are scarce. Forbs are generally overlooked and they are simply lumped into a non gross category um, in range conditions, condition assessments. Um, oftentimes studies only look at grasses up until species level and then forbs are just grouped into all remaining herbaceous plants so they don't really look at them on species level and then Forbs are generally not considered as a separate functional entity. They are simply just grouped with grasses or lumped with grasses when we want to calculate herbaceous biomass cover or dry matter production. <clears throat> and then some of the other challenges include that we all know that palatable perennial grass species are considered a, a stable and important food source for cattle and livestock and herbivores in savannas and consequently um, so assessments of range conditions often focus largely or are largely based on these dominant palatable perennial grass species and for these reasons the ecological function of forbs and how they respond to environmental drivers of herbaceous vegetation dynamics remain relatively unknown and unexplored and although a lot of research is still needed for us to study the complete functional identity of forbs and also how they respond to different environmental drivers and disturbances, we do know that forbs provide some general and very important um, functions and services. For example, forbs contribute significantly to the species richness of herbaceous layers in savannas and grasslands. And I included one of these graphs um, out of one of my papers where we looked at um, the total species or the species richness of forbs and grasses. And we looked at these across different herbivore treatments. And we found that it didn't matter if there were 
no herbivores or if all the herbivores were there or if some of the elephants were excluded, Forbed um, richness, which is represented by the orange bars, were significantly higher across all of these um, herbivore treatments. So they contribute significantly to um, species richness of herbaceous layers. Forbs have a high family diversity and they are a natural and distinct group of um, herbaceous layers. And importantly, a lot of forbs are actually toxic, so um, at least to humans and animals. So forbs contribute to about over 60% of the most toxic plants in South Africa. And this is a very important factor to keep in mind in range management. A variety of forb species are used for traditional food items and also for medicine. They provide forage for various types of herbivores from insects straight through to cattle and to the mega, mega fauna or mega herbivores such as elephants and rhinos. They are a nutritious food class for browsers and grazers um, and they constitute an important part of ungulate diet, um, especially at certain times of the year, um, particularly in the winter months or in the drier months. Um, if you can recall on the previous slide, I told you that forbs contribute significantly to species richness, but not only that, forbs contribute significantly to functional trait richness, um, and I took this out of the same article where we looked at the total, num of, total number of traits or trait richness, and we saw that once again, forbs or the orange bars contributed mostly to functional trait richness um, across all of the herbivore treatments. So they are functionally very, very important. And um, what is a functional trait? Those are the morphological, physiological, and phenological traits that affect the growth, survival, and reproduction of the species. So the morphological traits refers to um, what, a what a species looks li look like, what um, what physical attributes do they have? The physiological traits refers to the functions that happens inside a living organism for them to be able to survive. So the processes and functions inside. And then the phenological traits is how the morphological and physiological traits work together for biological events to take place. For example, migration, or um, hibernation or um, flowering time in the year. Um, yes, and then a function of the functional traits of a species ultimately um, provides that species with um, a performance so they can perform and survive in a certain area. And then lastly, forbs are very important for nutrient cycling in ecosystems and they contribute significantly to soil organic matter inputs into the soil. And a lot of forbs are also nitrogen fixers. So they also um, provide the soil or put nitrogen into the soil, which is a very important um, nutrient. Um, apart from the very important functions and services that forbs provide, they also exhibit various interesting features that enhance their ability to survive um, under different um, environmental conditions. For example, um, forbs have the ability to perform better under improved soil conditions, um, which includes um, increased nutrients in the soil or um, increased moisture content. They are better adapted to grow in shaded areas um, under the subcanopy of, of trees and shrubs. Um, they are well adapted to um, re-sprout quickly after fire events, and this is mainly due to the presence of underground storage organs that Forbes um, possess. And these underground storage organs um, is also seen as a drought adaptive trait um, and important for the persistent bud banks underneath the soil and also for viable seed banks. So forbs have the, they are resilient, so they are able to survive in a wide range of environmental conditions because, because they have different morphologies, regeneration strategies, and functional traits. 
And then um, many forbs are also symbiotically associated with specific insect species. So they support highly specialized faunal pollinator systems. Now, despite all of these important functions and services that I just mentioned, um, forbs are still associated with land degradation and perceived as being an undesirable functional group by land managers. Even though a lot of research has shown that understanding the dynamics and functions of the fob component is essential for the management of floral diversity of rangelands. And that is why we would like to include forbs in a range condition assessments um, of the response of vegetation to disturbances. And forbs can also be used as indicator species for ind indexing these effects um, on plant assemblages and to ultimately tell us something about ecosystem structure and function. So various approaches can be followed for us to try and address this gap in knowledge, um, which include, but are not limited to, um, increased long-term monitoring of FORB abundances, diversity and phenology. Um, FORBs need to be considered as a separate functional entity in ecological studies. Um, they should be included in global definitions and range condition assessments. And um, they should be studied both at species level, but also at functional trait level. And um, yeah, for ecology should be studied across vegetation types and biomes, because we need to learn about this life form, not only in certain habitats, but um, globally. So who might you ask is trying to fill this knowledge gap? <laughs> so I have at least one example. Um, which is the FORB Ecology Research Group with, with which I am affiliated. They are at the Northwest University's Potter Scrim campus under the leadership of Professor Francis Siebert. And they have a whole list of projects that they are looking at, trying to better understand the um, function and ecology of FORBs in savannas and grasslands. And I just briefly want to tell you about some of them. So as you can see, some of them are looking at the effect of fire and herbivory on the below ground regeneration of forbs in savannas. Others are looking at the effects of fire frequency on the recruitment attributes of forbs. Then there are the ones that are looking at um, specific species and their pharmacological, phytochemical and nutritional qualities. Um, others are looking at the carbon content uh, of grassland forbs across different functional groups. And then some are also looking at the recruitment ecology of, of grassland forbs in South Africa. Um, and me, I'm also privileged enough to be able to continue my passion in developing forb ecology research in South Africa um, through my PDP position at Ceylon. So um, yes, which uh, like Aisha mentioned in the beginning, it's the South African Environmental Observation Network. And I am doing this under the mentorship of Dr. Dave Thompson. And currently our project is called the Ecological Legacy Effects of Mega Carcasses in African Savannah Ecosystems. And the overarching question is how do mega carcasses influence terrestrial ecosystem processes. So how in the world is Forbes going to play a part in this? <laughs> Let me tell you. So um, large assemblages of herbivores can cause biogeochemical hotspots. And these are um, functionally important in creating dynamic landscapes of nutrient cycling, nutritious primary production, and also enhanced species diversity. However, these effects are not limited to living animals. So although assemblages of living animals cause all of these biogeochemical hotspots, the mortalities of, of animals can also cause nutrient pulses, which can leave long lasting legacy effects on the surrounding ecosystem. Yet little is known about the effects of individual processes and how the nutrient pulses they create affect the terrestrial ecosystem processes. Surprisingly, um, a lot more is known on this phenomenon in marine ecosystems where 
whale megacarcasses deposit large numbers of or pulses of um, carbon and nitrogen into nutrient poor deep sea. And this creates oases of production and biodiversity that can persist for decades. So um, given that we know little about uh, the effect of megacarcasses in terrestrial ecosystems, we will be focusing on the large or the mega carcasses, which are the large carcasses of mega herbivores and um, of the African elephant or Loxodonta africana, since they are the largest land animals, but we know very little about how the nutrients from their mega carcasses affect savannah ecosystems. But we do know that when one elephant dies, they deposit about 800 kilograms of carbon, 300 kilograms of nitrogen, and about 125 kilograms of phosphorus into the soil. And our hypothesis is that initially when the elephant dies, the area will be toxic for any plant growth, um, but increased plant productivity will be found at, um, at some older carcass sites. So um, although this is a multidisciplinary study, we've got some soil scientists, entomologists looking at the insect dynamics, We've got people looking at the mammals and also the bones. My focus will be on the vegetation component and especially the four grass coexistence um, and to see what happens um, in the surrounding area of the processes. And if you can recall that I mentioned earlier, forbs have the ability to um, take advantage of increased nutrient contents in the soil. So we will be expecting to see Forbs at the fresher processes since they are able to um, make use of this increased nutrient input from, from the carcass. Um, yeah, so um, I will be looking at plant productivity and forage quality in these nutrient um, hotspots, surveying, analyzing, and comparing the vegetation dynamics across carcass sites. And then also, like I said, my focus will be on the full grass dynamics and also looking at the plant functional traits. I just wanted to include some of the photographs of our previous field trips. And if I can focus your area on the left, top left-hand side over here, you can see the team is busy putting out the transit and you can see quite clearly the impact on, of the elephant carcass um, that, that it had on the surrounding environment. But here you can see there's already some forms establishing where grasses aren't able to. Like I said, they've got the ability to, um, to, to, make, to take advantage of increased nutrient input into the soil. And um, yes, I just wanted to show you that there's already some forms establishing there. And because of the... Um, Animal activity, you can also see these forbs are adapted to that by growing prostrate or close to the soil surface, flat, not erect or upright. That's me sitting next to a big elephant skull. Dr. Dave and I busy doing some plant surveys, counting and looking at the forbs and the grasses along the transect. And there's a, the, a part of the skull and femur. And yes, as you can see, it's quite a jaw dropping um, project that I am a part of. There's just jaws dropping everywhere. <laughs> um, yes, and I would like just to mention some of the links if you would like to follow us for some more information. The Ford Ecology Research Group has a website as well as the um, Mega Caucus Ecology. And then also third, you can find on Instagram and Facebook. So please go and have a look at what we are up to there. And um, I would like to thank you for um, coming out in the cold. Um, if you went to class today to come and listen about Forbes, and I hope that I could, could teach you something. And um, I know a lot of us see them next to the road and they are very pretty to look at but I hope that I um, showed you that they are not only um, important for us to look at, but they are very important for the functioning of, of ecosystems and also um, for herbaceous layer dynamics. So thank you for your attention. And I am now ready for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Dave.
you so much, Dr. Alga. That was a very beautifully done presentation. I think we all agree it was jaw dropping figurative day as well for us. And um, very, it was extremely informative. Um, I think it definitely increased my awareness of Forbes. I'm glad, Aisha. I'm glad that I did what I wanted to do. <laughs> no, I think I think the audience will agree. Uh, I think we'll, we're going to launch the poll now, Marit. Um, But at the same time, I, let's go for questions. So I saw there's already a question in the chat for you. Okay. So I'm going to read it to you, Dr. Van Kola. Uh, did you consider the traditional use of forb in your locality? What I noticed in my locality is that they are using herbal remedies. Those, the stinking weed, um, falls under the category of forbs. Yeah, like I mentioned, some of the students in our group um, is busy looking at the medicinal qualities of forbs. That is not necessarily one of my um, areas of expertise. I'm more of an ecologist, so I look at the whole system and community ecology. But yes, definitely the, um, the, the are um, people in our group starting to look at the medicinal qualities in the different communities. I know some of our group members um, are looking at certain forb species also growing in their communities at home. So yes, definitely they are starting to recognize that importance. I hope I um, answered the question. <laughs> okay, Baba I hope they answered your question. <laughs> um, just on that, and then I'm going to go to Holly. Uh, you said though that 60% of forbs are considered toxic to humans. Is that by ingestion or by touching it? Or I think a little bit of both. Used? Yeah. Um, um, oftentimes there are some forbs in the field as well. If you touch them, like the thistles, they really like burn your mm. the surface of your skin. But then um, if I can remember off the top of my head, something like solanum, the we call it chip apple keys, they've got yellow fruit. They are also um, toxic. And then a lot of, of the forb species um, make latex. So they are usually in the Euphorbia sea family. And um, whenever you see a plant that makes latex, you know it's a no-no, like maybe um, Spirustachus africana or the Tamgwiti boom. Never bry with that because it's going to chase you if you <laughs> use the wood to, to bry. <laughs> yeah, so those are a couple of, of examples of how they are toxic and can okay. be toxic. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to follow uh, Holly and then go to Kirsten. Um, first, Helga, just a couple of observations. The first one is, honestly, what a fantastic presentation. I, I will not hold back and say I didn't enter it with high expectations because I've never been to a talk on Forbes where I found it fascinating. And I did botany at university. And that one was incredible. So Hello. thank you. Thank you um, so much. Second off, I was kind of interested with your comment that a lot of Forbes are associated with land degradation and therefore are an unwanted clade. And I'm from Kenya and I've certainly never come across that. So now I've got to open my eyes and think, do we think the same way in East Africa as obviously that point of view comes from Southern Africa? I'd have to think about that one. Um, but my two questions, and there were three, but one's fallen out of the other ear. So I will have to come <laughs> back with that one is, OK, so you have these carcasses of of mega herbivores, let us say. How do you, at the end of your project, when, when you hope to publish, account for two things? One, vultures, because you said, you know, there's 300 grams of whatever of carbon and then nitrate, but the vultures come and they tear that carcass apart so quickly if there are vultures present. So, you know, part of it would also be, I mean, like you say, you look at the large picture and the large picture of ecology is so complex. We're looking at a, an, an Africa loss of vultures across the continent. Now, how is that affecting all of these dynamics that you're looking at is my first question to you. And I'll let you answer that before I ask the second. <laughs> thank you, Holly. That's very interesting. And thank you for the question. Um, 
luckily, we, like I said, we are a multidisciplinary group of people. Um, so I am the botanist at this stage, um, me and Dave affiliated with the project, but we do have, like I said, people with knowledge on mammals and people that are going to look at the bones. So um, I'm definitely going to make a mental note to mention that to them um, because it is a very valid point. And we also, never mind the vultures, the bones generally tend to just get spread across Sometimes we don't even find the skull and you would think this massive skull wouldn't move around a lot, but they do. So um, I'm, I'm going to leave that to the experts to maybe build that into the model to um, compensate for that loss, but I'm definitely going to make a mental note. That's a very valid point. Thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, I think it would almost be, you know, building that into the model would be a critical thing because that could also <laughs> show the value of of vultures. Now, my second question comes fire, because obviously fire comes through. Now, is your aim to get to the carcass and do this study before potentially fire comes through? And how long once you've found that carcass, and yes, the bones are distributed and everything, but how long once you've found that carcass, do you go back to that site to collect data? And what happens if fire does come through? Does that make it null and void in your in your final data analysis, which you haven't got to yet. So I know this is prophesizing the future. Where would you go? <laughs> How would you deal with that problem? Wow. Um, honestly, I haven't really thought about the fire aspect because it is in the savannah and a lot of the carcasses, because we are dependent on the field ranges to tell us where the carcasses are. So obviously we can't um, <laughs> tell an elephant to die there at this time and then so we have to go where they are and they also vary in ages and logistically it's very difficult because a lot of the um, collaborators are American so um, yeah it's difficult for us to go there as soon as we can or as soon as we hear about the caucus which would be ideal to get as much data um, at the fresh site as we can but that is why we try to, when we are in the field and we get the information from the ranges, we try to balance them out to try to find new carcasses, maybe three months old. And then we've got carcasses of two years old. And um, at some of those, we have already two sets of data collected. Um, but yes, as far as possible and logistically possible, we, we try to visit them as often as possible. Um, yeah. But, but for three months or six months, at what point do you give up and say, right, now we're done visiting that carcass site, which it would be in the end? Honestly, the project is registered until mid-2025. So I guess <laughs> we'll do a full survey this year and maybe next year and then start writing up. That would be my answer. But the 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 aspect about fire is interesting and I don't think we as a group has has discussed that yet so another mental that note that I could, know. that could be Helga and we have some fantastic students in this class and Michelle I will hand over to you right now but that could be a follow-up study for some students to go okay you've got all these carcass sites pinned now in six months or one year after 2025, one of these students wanted to do some sort of project, they could get that data off you and do a follow up just to see what was there. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Michelle, before I get to the classroom with our primary audience, uh, I think I'm going to go to Kirsten. Hi, Kirsten. Thanks, Aisha. Hi, good morning. Um, I first want to make a little comment, uh, Helga, um, which is something that one of my colleagues um, pointed out in a, in a very cool way. She says, and you know who you are, she says, um, how old is Helga? Because she also, she also she's also flipping young for a postdoc. I thought that was quite <laughs> cool because Helga, you do look incredibly young. And maybe that's an inspiration to all our students in Michelle's class um, that you can do amazing things um, very quickly, actually, if you're very dedicated and committed to it and passionate. <laughs> um, I've got two questions, Holger. Um, the one, well, they're probably quite quickly answered questions. The one is about termites, um, termite mounds, and whether that has a big effect on 
for diversity um, uh, as obviously um, as there's a nutrients, I think you called it a biogeochemical bio hotspot, hot spot. maybe. Yes. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I would just be interested to hear about, about termite mounds and their impact on Forbes. And then the other one is around, um, you mentioned that Forbes obviously uh, occur uh, very, uh, to a large proportion in uh, savannas, but which other biomes do they occur in? Is it across uh, biomes or yeah, I'd just be interested to hear. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. And yes, on the first comment, um, I turned 34 at the end of the year. So um, I was privileged to have a lot of doors being opened, but you have to be willing to grab every opportunity um, and work hard. So it's definitely possible for anyone to, to pursue a, a career in postgraduate studies and um, learning about the ecology of plants. It's definitely um, possible. Um, hard work and dedication, like Kirsten said, and also passion, that's very important to try and figure out what your passion is and, and follow that and just learn more. Um, it's possible, definitely. Um, and then the first question, thank you, that's very interesting. Yes, um, termite mounds are also considered as nutrient hotspots in the matrix of um, habitats or environments. And um, Andrew Davies is another um, scientist that that's really his forte. He has done a lot of studies on, on termite mound dynamics. I'm not sure if he included the fourth component a whole lot, but um, yes, they definitely are nutrient hotspots and maybe another gap that we can look at. I, I, don't, I don't know of anyone yet who has looked at termite mounds and full grass um, dynamics, but I suppose there will be some interesting forbs that you will find there maybe um, and not somewhere else, which is interesting. And I wish I could look at all of these things because the more you know, the more you know that you don't know a lot of things. <laughs> so yes, thank you for that. It's it's definitely, I think, a gap that might be able to be filled, looking at specifically for grass and termite nuts. And then the second question, um, yes, uh, there are a lot of other biomes that um, have forbs in their vegetation layer, um, and also specifically in our forb ecology research group, a lot of new research is coming up in, in grasslands, um, because <laughs> even Prof. Francie said the other day she wants to call them forblands, because oftentimes there's so many forbs, even more than grasses in the grassland, um, so yes, um, definitely, and at Feinbos, I, I guess you can maybe classify those as forbs as well. Um, yeah, so definitely in the other biomes as well. And then I suppose in the forests, you will find a lot of heavily shade adapted um, forb species in the subcanopy habitat. Uh, thanks, Helga. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Justin. Uh, yeah, Olga, I think you made everybody's jaw drop a second time with your age. Congratulations <laughs> on achieving that much at such a young age. Thank you so much, Aisha. Well <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go to the primary audience uh, with Michelle, and then I'm going to go on to, uh, on to the chat, questions in the chat. So, Michelle. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you very much, Halga, for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, it's very interesting to see the work um, on the carcasses as well, and this is not a question, it's just a comment. Um, I'm wondering how, I know there's a lot of work that's been done on diseases and disease persistence, um, and I'm wondering if that toxicity is kind of a mechanism to keep grazers away um, until that disease has gone um, for the forbs and the grasses and things grow. Anyway, okay, that's just a little sidebar. My actual question, I have two questions. So you're absolutely right. We do teach here, and this class is going to be doing it in the second semester to do vegetation condition assessments. And we come across a forb and we say forb. Okay, so we've got no idea what we, we don't account for uh, different kinds of species and what they bring to the table. So I'm wondering um, how far are we to some sort of standardized methodology, that's my first question, to bring that in? Because it's fine to say we must consider forms, 
But the second question is, considering the diversity across taxa, right? I mean, grass is one family. It's relatively easy if you compare it to Forbes. How realistic is it to bring in the detail of Forbes or would it be growth forms we're looking for? How, how practical is it and how would one go about including Forbes into vegetation condition assessment? Thank you, Michelle. Yes, that's very um, two very interesting questions and important questions. Um, I think I'll start with the second one. Um, well, the second one was this, oh, how realistic. Okay, so I think that's one of the reasons um, a lot of people just lump them into a non-gross category because they are so difficult to get to know and identify. Um, but I think it is still so important. And I think it is realistic because we have a lot of different field guides that are on the shelves available now. And um, although a lot of them are from the Limpopo province, um, a lot of the species also occur in, in the high felt or in the grasslands as well. So, um, and then of course you have a lot of herbariums that you can use to um, like sandy or some of the floras online. Um, so I think although it is very challenging and it is difficult, I think it, it is important for us to slowly but surely start to incorporate Forbes in our range condition assessments, although it is quite daunting, um, I think it is important. So I can suggest herbariums, um, floras, um, books, field guides, and then floras online. Um, but then, like you also mentioned, the functional trait aspect is very important. So even if you can't um, go on to species level, maybe just give them pseudo names. Um, but then, of course, you can't go into species specific type of questions, but you can still answer something about the functioning if you include functional traits or um, yeah, the types of forms that you found in a certain area. And then can you just maybe repeat the first question? Sorry, I can't remember um, now what that was. So the first question relates to how close we are to methodology. And I'd like oh, to yeah. add a little bit of that. Um, because you know, the grasses, we know what's palatable or what contributes to grazing, etc. But for the breadth of forbs, we have no idea. So how does one incorporate that into a standardized methodology condition system? Okay, yes. Um, as for a standardized methodology pertaining specifically to Forbes, I don't think something has been published yet. I know Prof. Francis Siebert is very um, busy in trying to actually just define what a Forb is, because a lot of times it's um, specific to your study. So you define a Forb as this. But globally, there's still a lot of confusion to what a Forb actually is. So I know she's working very hard on, on actually just finding a definition that is um, that can be applied globally. And I think once that is there, it will be easier for us to maybe start to write a, a standard protocol to, to sample thoughts. But as for one that is um, set in stone, I don't think there is one yet. But um, there are a lot of studies um, and articles that, uh, that has been published that looked at Forbes. So maybe you can um, do a little bit of research on that and see in the different systems um, what types of methods the, the studies used. And then maybe just adapt that to suit your um, question or what you want to answer or your, your environment. Um, I know there's a lot of like um, Whitaker plots or transects where we put out plots next to the transect. But yeah, like I said, there's not like a yet a standard protocol for us to, to um, sample forms per se. <laughs> so there's another gap that we need to fill pretty soon because people are starting to gain a lot of interest in them. Uh, thank you, Michelle. I think Michelle has sound issues. So, uh, Yalga, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the chat because there are a okay. couple of questions there. And we've, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. The first one, which was already more than 10 minutes ago, was from Justin Henry. And he asks Hi, Yalga. Great presentation. Thank you. 
Do you think grassland for diversity will be negatively affected by the absence of herbivores from a protected area? And can fire alone be used to manage the habitat with the aim of ensuring high plant species richness? Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, well, I can answer that at least from a savanna perspective. Um, if you exclude herbivores, it definitely has a negative effect on bulb richness and diversity. Um, because then what tends to happen is grasses like Panica maximum, they, they are um, large tufted graminoids that tend to um, outcompete the four species for resources such as light and water and nutrients. So yes, definitely if you exclude herbivores, I would hypothesize that the same would happen for grasslands, but then there's yet another question that someone out there can try to answer, but I would think it would also have a negative effect. And then fire, yes, it's definitely a very handy management tool um, for the diversity of forbs. Although I did do some research, um, fire didn't um, have that much of an effect on forb diversity. It is very important to keep the system open and the biomass levels of grasses low. So I can imagine it will have a positive effect for the forb component um, because they won't get outcompeted by this moribund um, grass material that gets accumulated. Um, but yes, like I said, in my in all of my studies, herbivory came out as the more important and rainfall, herbivory and rainfall. Fire was more a secondary driver of for diversity. But yes, in savannas, fire definitely a very important management tool that can be used. You're on mute, Aisha. Sorry, I think you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I was just saying that uh, there's a question from Sue from Kenya, who joined a bit late, but I think I'm just going to answer that. Uh, Sue missed the question on Santa Mike Mounds. Uh, so the highlights uh, and the entire YouTube video will be available on our website in about a week in a YouTube form. So I'm going to go then to Zamadube Dube. Hi, Alga. Thank you for a great presentation. I just want to find out if research has been done on alien invasive state of forms and how many species have been classified as indigenous. Okay, thank you. That's also a very good question. Um, there are some alien invasive species and I think there is some research being done. Once again, not one of my main fields of study, and I can maybe just say um, in all of my studies, there's like, I would say even just five species out of the hundreds that I found that was alien invasive. All of the others are, are not alien. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, but there are definitely folks that are um, not indigenous. Um, and then they obviously also tend to take over quite quickly. So it is in, an important factor to keep in mind. In, in range condition assessment. Aisha, I think Michelle had her hand risen, so I'm not sure if you want to go back to the classroom. Yes, um, I do want to go back there and then afterwards, uh, Dr. Gula from Nigeria, we've got your question. I'll ask it after Michelle. Thank you very much. So we've got two more questions. So in class, we discussed um, in savannah ecosystems, the tree grass interactions and competitive effects and the debate around that and that the jury is still out and all sorts of things. So we have a question around grass and fall competition and how do they compete and maintain a balance in the system? That was the first question. The second question was around fire. So we know that when a fire runs through a grassland, the grasses, uh, the grasses get rejuvenated and does this do the same thing for forks? Okay, thank you for the interesting questions. <laughs> um, so like I said, one of the main st study or focus areas is for me to try and disentangle this for grass coexistence. And yes, it is actually a quite a dynamic coexistence, which it differs depending on the environmental factors that you have in the system. 
So um, for example, like I mentioned earlier, if we excluded all herbivores, we found that grasses tended to dominate over forbs, um, outcompeting them for resources. So, um, but then when you bring herbivores back into a system that developed um, under evolutionary time with that environmental driver, we found that that balance was a little bit more equal or even more towards the forbs um, being more dominant than grasses. So it's very important to study this coexistence for different environments for us to understand it because it is so dynamic, but it is very interesting and there is definitely some very cool interactions taking place. And like I said, with the carcasses, we would expect forbs to dominate earlier on. And then as the carcasses get older, we would expect the grasses to come and take over and outcompete the forms again. So yes, um, that's very interesting and something to, to keep in mind. And as for the fire question, I'm sorry, I'm trying to make mental notes, but can you just repeat, Michelle? Fire? So a student wanted to know if um, Forbes have, if there's the same regenerating effect on Forbes um, due to fire as there is for grass forbs. Yes, as you can recall in my talk, I mentioned something about underground storage organs. A lot of forbs have this um, attribute or functional trait. So it doesn't matter if the fire comes um, over the forb and the above ground plant material gets um, burnt dead, gone. They still have that ability to re-sprout when environmental conditions become favorable. So yes, definitely fire has the ability for forbs also to re-sprout um, because of that underground storage organs that they possess. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much, Dr. Alga. Uh, I'm going to just read uh, Dr. Gula, who's joining us all the way from Nigeria. Wow. I'm going to read his question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but then after that, Sue, if it's okay with you, I will unmute you to ask your question. Okay, so let's go to Dr. Agbula's question. He wants to know, is the stinking weed, the genus or the species name is Senna occidentalis, falls under the classification of Forbes? Um, um, are you able to answer that? Yeah, I would, I would definitely classify it as a Forb, yes. I would, I would classify it as a Forb because we do have also, um, is it Senna, right? S-E-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. We found um, we have different species there in the Kruger Park as well, Sena Italica, and we definitely classify that as a form. Okay, thank you. And I hope that answered your question, Dr. Agula. Okay, thank you. All right. And then uh, we've got very few minutes left. And so <laughs> I'm going to ask Sue to unmute to ask her question. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to this um, uh, webinar. So interesting, and I'm so sorry I, I missed such a lot. Um, and I'm looking forward to the replay. My question to Dr. Helga, um, I'm studying soil microbes. I'm one of the, I'm, I'm a certified lab technician from the Soil Food Web um, course, the Soil Food Web uh, School. And um, we're looking at microbes in the soils and their connection to um, nutrient cycling productivity of crops and the, the damage and the connection between our production systems and our, and our production inputs, all with a view to regenerative agriculture and looking at what that actually means from a soil microbial perspective. When we're looking at Forbes, and, and I heard you mention, um, to, I've never heard the word Forbes, by the way, until today, so I, I was Googling it. Now I know, okay, my <laughs> two questions. One is, are Lantana Forbes? Because I'm currently clearing away Lantana that are just going mad in a certain place. But the other thing is um, on the, I've done soil sampling on two different farms and they're hundreds of kilometers apart. And um, both farmers spoke about how for some odd reason, there were certain patches that were massively productive um, when they were left alone. Um, and when they were using their normal agricultural chemicals and things on them, they were, they were not that, that much more productive. But when we talked about that massive production, it's almost like and one guy said that he got um, wheat, um, ears that grew 30 seeds in that area, whereas six meters away, there were only 10 seeds per, per ear. And I, I've looked at the soil in both of them, and um, I found that 
coincidentally, but probably not so because it's the action of the termites, of course, they both have these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, Arcella testate amoebas in them. They don't have the normal amoebas. And the, the microbiology in there is so very different. We do expect the fungal microbiology to be different because they're termites and they do their own you know, fungal culturing, et cetera. But so different. And, and I'm just you know, joining the dots and thinking when you're talking about forbs and when you're talking about their regrowth and everything, and when you talk about the microbes and the microbes that actually that, that you know, the fact that they're holobionts and the fact that they coexist together. Are you studying the two together? Are you able to actually look at places and say, these places are going to be perfect for these kind of forms because these guys have got the kind of biology that they, the microbiology they like, or are you mapping any of those um, correlations or anything? Lots of, a uh, waffling, but <laughs> I have to go yeah. over <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Yes, oh my word. I just, I just realize more and more that there's so many research gaps when it comes to Forbes. But um, at least for the Caucus project, we are looking at some of the microbe activities as well. But I'm not sure that there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge available on the Forbes microbe coexistence as well. So yes, that's yet another thing that we really need to start looking at and including forms in our studies because I don't have a lot of, lot of knowledge on that. Well, you know what? In South Africa now, you've got the highest number, and it's not a lot, but you've got the highest number of certified lab technicians by the Saw Fuber program who are looking at microbiology in South Africa. There are like 13 experts spread around. And I mean, maybe I can link you with one of them and then you can start to find out who they are, where they are, because they're testing things all the time, they're mapping things all the time, and you, they could form a really mm. rich data for your work as well. Yeah, thank you. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Sue. Pleasure. Pleasure. Sue, um, thank you, Yalga. So with that, it's already half past nine. I just want to check, is Johan in? To give a final thing. Uh, no, he's had to he's had to leave, Aisha. Okay. Um, Aisha, yeah. before you before you had on, I and I know the students are kind of leaving, which is fine, but I wonder if Babi Jide, you could unmute and tell us a bit about your program there in Nigeria, because you seem to have a lot of knowledge on these different areas and it might link nicely. Yeah, thanks very much. A very good presentation there. Um Apparently, there's a lot of research going on around, but here um, the coordination is a bit faulty because uh, everybody is um, a one man battle squad. Unlike your end there, where you have a lot of collaborations taking place. So, um, what I basically try to do is put information out and um, see whoever is interested and um, we'll partner with what we try to do. Um, then record keeping is um, kind of sketchy here. Everybody keeps their records to themselves. So that's why um, I use some of the international uh, acclaimed um, sources to put out my information, as in I naturalist, and um, there's a bird survey too going on in Nigeria here. So yes, a lot is going on, but we need to um, have everybody collaborate, like what you guys are doing in your own end, and um, I tell people one tree doesn't make a forest. And unless we all, all over Africa, coordinate ourselves, we can't know what is in our backyard. Thank you very much. I'm wondering um, if Dr. Agula and Sue, maybe if you could share, even if it's privately, or if you prefer to do it publicly, your contact details. Because I'm wondering, maybe Alka, you might want to get in contact. Or you want to contact each other? Yeah, definitely. That would be. Yeah, and then. Oh, thank you. I see Sue's email. Yeah, and um, I think mine is on the PowerPoint. But should I just put it in the chat as well? Yes, please. I think it will okay. just help just for now. Okay. And then um, after that, I think yeah, there's no more questions, no more in the chat, and we are over time. And so after that, yes, there's all the details. 
yeah, we will also send uh, you all the comments in the chat. That Thank I sent you. To you Yalga. Yes, Thank so you. Can I, can I just ask one more question? I know the students are leaving, but again, it's on the student side, Helga. I mean, when you talk about all of these things, and especially the carcasses and the Forbes, is there not a place for citizen science to collect photos of carcasses from across Africa at any time? And then you can identify the Forbes just by looking at them to see. I mean, I know that's not like a specific type of data collection, but it would still amount to a huge level of knowledge. So is that something like a student could do from, from TUT, for example, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. We um already the other day we've um we got an email from someone in the Northern Cape <laughs> and it was sad, but the ostrich hit a fence and it died. And then daisies just started coming out. So and they also sent us the photos and asked us about it. And yes, so we are very open to sharing photos and, and IDing Forbes as far as possible, definitely, anytime. Yeah, okay. Because I mean, imagine how many tourists go around and see carcasses as well. Exactly. They, some, well. Anyway, that was just a thought on students, but thank you once again. And Sue and Babadija, thank you for your um, input, which was amazing. Yes, thank you so much. I would also like to thank you. <laughs> I can see Holly's passion being expressed here. So you guys also have each other's contact details. I just want to make a comment quickly on that. And this is uh, actually more towards Sue, is that what we also saw, this was research that was like 10 years ago uh, with the marigolds and the nematodes that also caused those patches. So yeah, it's all connected. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, just I'm just thinking when you said about the daisies that just popped up. Yeah. <laughs> But okay, with that, I think we need to close because we are over time. Yeah. yeah.